The following reading is from a letter that Benjamin Rush wrote to Thomas Jefferson in 1800. Rush was the most important founding father you never heard of. He was the only universalist signer of the Declaration of Independence. This is what he wrote to Thomas Jefferson. I agree with you, likewise, in your wishes to keep religion and government independent of each other. Were it possible for St. Paul to rise from his grave at the present juncture, he would say to the clergy who are now so active in settling the political affairs of the world, cease from your political labors. Your kingdom is not of this world. Read my epistles. In no part of them will you perceive me aiming to dispose a pagan emperor or place a Christian upon the throne. Christianity disdains to receive support from human governments. From this, it derives its preeminence over all the religions that have ever or shall ever exist in the world. Human governments may receive support from Christianity, but it must be only from the love of justice and peace which it is calculated to produce in the minds of men. By promoting these and all other Christian virtues by your precepts and example, you will much sooner overthrow errors of all kind and establish our pure and holy religion in the world than by aiming to produce by your preaching or pamphlets any change in the political state of mankind. Benjamin Rush in 1800. Four years ago, on July, four days ago, on July 4th, I had the privilege of attending the naturalization ceremony in Monticello, where 74 people from 36 countries around the world became new American citizens. It was a long, hot morning not particularly conducive to close attention to speeches. What did strike me though, was the oath of citizenship where 74 people in accented English spoke the following words. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen. That I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by law, that I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by law. And I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. What struck me about this statement was that it was undertaken with the presumption of shared values, regardless of diverse backgrounds and experiences. So today, I wanna to talk about values, our values, our Unitarian Universalist values. For those who missed it, last month, our General Assembly voted to restate our seven principles as six values, justice, equity, transformation, pluralism, interdependence, generosity, also known by the acronym of Jet Pig. <laughs> but even though ascribing to these values, many Unitarian Universalists and indeed many progressive groups go quite silent in the face of a cruel remark or forceful untruth or breathtaking statement or opinion from leaders that we were taught to respect. I want to explore why this is so. I also want to consider the folly of separating personal values from duties our elected and or appointed officials have 
to make and enforce laws that advantage all the people in all their diversity. And I wanna suggest ways in which we might move toward a more perfect union. Throughout history, prophets has stood at the corner of church and state. Their calling is to speak truth to power, pass judgment on cultural and political norms, and urge us to be better than we are. There has never been much reward in prophecy. No one wants to hear that the end is near and it's your fault. <laughs> through the ages, we have managed to rid ourselves of our public prophets through crucifixion, imprisonment, burning at the stake, or shooting them, or simply ignoring them. At the very least, a modern prophet who takes seriously the charge to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable risks losing their job. None of us comfortable people wish to be afflicted. There are, of course, exceptions. The Reverend Dr. William Barber with his Moral Monday movement is the first that comes to mind. But for the most part, we don't often speak to our moral outrage with much force or consistency. Why? I have an idea that one reason is because we don't want to be like them. You know, them whose opinions are emotionally rooted. You know, those Christians whose voices seem to dominate the public square. But the liberal religious voice not only has a place in public discourse, it has an urgent responsibility to proclaim our liberal religious values. Let's define liberal religion. Religious liberalism has two distinctive characteristics. The first is a posture of intentional engagement with modern culture. Generally, we try to live in the current age rather than pining for the good old days or anticipating the sweet by and by. The other characteristic of liberal religion is a commitment to free religious inquiry. We have open-ended and flexible faith communities and are mostly comfortable with religious pluralism. Let's look at our congregations. At any given time, we have people who claim their primary source of practice or inspiration as Buddhism or Judaism or Christianity or humanism or paganism or all of the above or nothing in particular. But because we are so adaptive to the culture and are relatively tolerant of pluralism, we face five dilemmas that affect our social justice work or our prophetic practice in the public square. I'm going to unpack each one of them. And no, there will not be a quiz at the end of this. <clears throat> Dilemma number one is that the theological tensions inherent in religious liberalism sometimes cause us to stumble over our best intentions. Traditionally, the prophet stands inside and outside of society. They straddle the corner of church and state. The problem is that cultural adaptation, the very trait that defines us as religious liberals, can easily lead to familiarity and comfort. It is difficult for someone from the social and economically privileged classes, like us, to speak effectively on behalf of the poor and powerless. We belong to the very establishment we are seeking to critique. So overturning the existing system would be contrary to our own individual and institutional interests. In other words, it's like asking us to chew off our own leg to be freed from a trap. When my spouse and I lived in Florida, we had a four day debate on where best to place a political road sign that had the best chance of keeping violently opposing voices away from our front door. We all mean well, but are not anxious to make ourselves a target. 
The second dilemma that hinders our liberal religious prophetic practice is the ongoing debate about the proper role of religion in the public square. We need to get past our prejudice of speaking religiously in public. That is something that proper Unitarian Universalists just don't do. We are almost hysterically concerned about appearing to proselytize, even though articulating our values without an attempt to convert someone to our way of thinking is a far cry from proselytizing. Back in 2016, Michael Gerson noted, we are witnessing what happens to right-wing politics becomes when right-wing politics becomes untethered from morality and religion. What does public life look like without the constraining internal force of character, without the firm ethical commitments often rooted in faith? That was written eight years ago. Now, right-wing politics has replaced religion and to a lesser degree, so has left-wing politics. So far, we've identified two factors that keep us relatively quiet in the public square, theological tension and pluralism and our abhorrence of emotionalism and proselytizing. The third dilemma that affects our prophetic practice is the question, what does it mean to speak religiously? This is a complicated question for Unitarian Universalists because our vision of a just society, for example, is informed by many sources. But our religious convictions, however, that is defined by an individual. Those play a major role. Let me give you an example of the impact of speaking religiously. In 2013, Moral Mondays became a national news story. The Reverend Dr. William Barber had been laying the groundwork for a state-by-state -state movement which united black, white, and brown, rich and poor, employed, unemployed, gay, straight, documented, undocumented, religious, and secular peoples. That's a lot of diverse peoples. The purpose was to protect draconian laws and fear-mongering legislators. Reverend Barber's grounding was in Christian theology specifically Psalm 94. Who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against evildoers? If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would have soon lived in the land of silence. Barber linked secular policies with religious justifications thereby deepening the arguments and most likely reaching a wider audience. At the very least, speaking religiously gives legislators an alternative religious perspective that counterbalances the arguments that religious conservatives have long been making. The success of Barber's Poor People campaign was seen just a week or so ago on June 29th, when thousands of people mostly low-wage workers, gathered on the Washington Mall to demand that the Senate restore the Full Voting Rights Act, pass the For the People Act, end the filibuster, increase the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour, and fairly and respectfully treat the nation's one million immigrants. The fourth dilemma that affects liberal religious practice is the tension that emerges from our commitment to the separation of church and state. While Americans broadly agree that religious freedom is a good thing, we're truly at loggerheads on the extent of which religious groups should influence public policy. Our political and theological starting points affect our view about these difficult issues. For instance, I believe with all my heart on the separation of church and state, but I don't believe that it is possible to leave your values aside while you go about the business of the state. You could and you should set aside your denominational affiliations, but it's very difficult to separate yourself from your values. I'm going to suggest why it's so difficult in a minute. 
So let's recap before we leave the reasons that we go quiet in the face of loud emotional expressions of values not shared by us. Liberal religious voices have been ineffective in the public square because first, we seem wishy-washy. We hold various theological positions and embrace pluralism. Second, we are mightily uncomfortable with emotionalism and proselytizing. Third, we don't agree about speaking about religion in public. And perhaps this harkens back to the days when it was impolite to speak about religion and money. And fourth, we can't agree on the details on what it means to separate church and state. Although these four dilemmas are important, I think the fifth dilemma is the most immediate. And that is the challenge of engaging in public prophetic practice under conditions of empire. Empire. Unlike the empires of the past, the American empire of the 21st century relies on indirect influence through various forms of pressure and intervention. America's empire's unwritten constitution sanctions vast public and private owners limited only by opportunity and ambition. To sustain the empire, it is necessary to keep citizens in a generalized feeling of insecurity and powerlessness. A generalized feeling of insecurity and powerlessness. Does this sound familiar? Add to this mix the tactics of sowing division between groups of people and you have the cultural and political climate of 2024. I told you I would attempt to explain why it's so difficult to change a person's mind. Why lawmakers and law enforcers can't just park their beliefs and values as they go about their duties. There's been a lot of research into where values come from and why it's hard for people to change their minds. Researchers have shown that the human species have survived by belonging to a collaborative group, a hyper-social niche in the scheme of things. Reason evolved to solve problems posed by living in those collaborative groups, not to evaluate data. So enter confirmation bias a form of faulty thinking that leads people to embrace information that supports their beliefs, beliefs formed in their group, and to reject information that contradicts them. Confirmation bias is an adaptive function that is related to our hypersociability. People experience genuine pleasure, a rush of dopamine, when processing information that supports their beliefs. It feels good to Stick to your guns, even though we are wrong, they observe. Confirmation bias doesn't threaten expulsion from a group, which at base is often felt to be worse than death. That's why the practice of shunning is so effective. There's a tremendous pressure to conform to group norms. In the political arena, this is complicated by what is called the illusion of explanatory depth. This is just a shorthand way of saying that people, voters and legislators, some legislators, believe they know way more than they actually do. As a rule, strong feelings about an issue don't emerge from a deep understanding of that issue. This is borne out when someone takes a position that the Affordable Care Act, for instance, is a bunch of hooey. But when asked to explain what they know about the Affordable Care Act, it turns out that they don't know much at all. But if enough people in that person's group declare it to be hooey, that person will echo those strong feelings. So far, we've heard the reasons why we are so quiet at the corner of church and state. We've taken a cursory look at the research showing why it's so difficult to change core beliefs and worldviews with facts and logic. 
So where do we go from here? How will we move to a more perfect union? First, we Unitarian Universalists need to clarify our religious identity. We cannot stand at the corner of church and state unless we have a clear understanding of why prophetic social justice work is religious work. The overarching principle of religious liberalism is rooted in a commitment to radical human equality. This was best articulated in universalism's core theological insight. All humanity, indeed all of creation, is ultimately united in a common destiny. Let me repeat that. All humanity, indeed all creation, is ultimately united in a common human destiny. This is what Benjamin Rush believed and acted upon. As we identify who we are as Unitarian Universalists, we need to form alliances with other liberal religious groups. This means we need to get over our knee-jerk negative response to people calling themselves Christians. UU theologian James Luther Adams warned about confusing the teachings of Jesus with the teachings about Jesus. There's a difference. The teachings of Jesus are contained in the Jefferson Bible or in some denominations in the Red Letter Bible. These are words ascribed to Jesus of Nazareth a historical figure condemned by the government for inciting public disorder and sentenced to death by crucifixion. Everything that follows are the teachings about Jesus. Christianity has been hijacked by those purporting to follow the teachings about Jesus. As shown in Benjamin Rush's letter to Thomas Jefferson and on January 6, 2020, by those carrying signs conflating Jesus with the former president of the United States. There's nothing in the teachings of Jesus that would warrant a forceful overthrow of a government. Nothing. Each of the mainline Christian denominations have a liberal wing. In fact, United Church of Christ is virtually indistinguishable from Unitarian Universalism. So much so that the joke goes that UCC stands for Unitarians Considering Christ. <laughs> Some of these people from the mainline Christian denominations are now distinguishing themselves from the so-called Christians by identifying themselves as Jesus followers. The UU Christian Fellowship's tagline is freely following Jesus. Another thing that we can do is to respond with kindness and understanding to people yearning for the comfort of clarity about rules and consequences. Who among us wouldn't like a little certainty these days? Granted, we may abhor the set of rules, but at least we know where we stand. I think one of the many reasons that so many of us are so frightened and unhappy is that we thought that many of the issues that we fought for, abortion, marriage equality, voting rights, the rule of law for everyone, were settled. Now, imagine how frightened and unhappy people might be who see what they thought was settled. The primacy of white men, marriage between a man and a woman, the very definition of male and female, the inferiority of the other. The belief in the efficacy of pulling oneself up by one's bootstraps and the inevitable reward of hard work. All of that is being challenged. No wonder people are unhappy. Remember, to sustain the empire, it is necessary to keep citizens in a generalized feeling of insecurity and powerlessness. In this time and space, we need to take a deep breath and ground ourselves by remembering that the American impulse toward empire is only one side of the coin. 
the impulse toward democracy still beats. If we pay attention beyond the media-fed drumbeat of fear, we can see that the beat is getting stronger. We still question our leaders. We still emphasize ethics over doctrine in our commitment to justice. And we still submit to what Cornell West calls a tragic comedy commitment to hope. These three factors, questioning, justice, and hope, are the spiritual wellsprings of a reinvigorated democracy and are also basic to religious liberalism. This is the message of healing and hope our prophetic social justice practice brings to the world. Now we need to carry that message out into the public square, to the corner of church and state. If you can't march, you can write. If you can't write, you can talk. You can listen. You certainly can vote. And when we are scorned, threatened, or targeted, let us remember that we have a community in Unitarian Universalism where we can rest, bind up our wounds, tell our stories, and refresh each other with laughter and hope. May we have the bold courage to make it so. Amen. <laughs>